Hi, everybody. It's John Jay. Thanks for joining. Today is January 4th, beginning of the year, first call of the year. Appreciate y'all joining. And uh, I want to just just introduce, well, I guess maybe I could introduce uh, Jim. Jim's here and uh, he's been so instrumental and helpful and we're partnered together and we're starting to produce some new content. So it's going to be quite interesting. And I'm going to introduce some new new ideas that we're, th things we're working on. Uh, especially we're going to talk about FinCEN. I guess we're going to keep talking about that. Um, but I wanted to uh, share a little bit of history about some things I've done over the years. So before I do that, the uh, the new website you're going to see, so we had aceofcoins.com, which we still have for right now, and we have privacyfight.io video membership. We might consolidate that. It looks like we're consolidating that into aceofcoins.club. So minor change, you know, you'll see it. Um, we have the, um, the uh, Dallas conference coming up on January 19th. And there's a, a landing page explaining about that at aceofcoins.club. People are still calling me, uh, but I can't answer the phone. So let's check it over there. Um, so what I wanted to uh, just make a, a brief comment on is I talked to I talk to uh, people that are involved with groups of people. And many people in the groups have are, are clients of mine, and they've been for many of them for five or six years, actually, uh, since cryptos became really popular. And they say nice things about me. I, I think most of them say nice things. Maybe some don't. Um, but there there was a, a group in particular that, uh, from what I understand, there was many people that found it difficult to reach me. And I just don't like when that when I hear that. Um, but I, I have to uh, say that, you know, people that reach me and that begin working with me, I like to establish a relationship if I can, as long as possible so that we have somewhat of a understanding of how we like to do things. And in that, I think that by that time, you could find several points of contact to reach me and I try to make myself available. And remember, I am one person, there's a limited time, but again, it's, I'd like to just make myself available. As you know, some of you will call me on Sunday. I shouldn't say that because then you're gonna start calling me on Sunday. But if you call me on Sunday, and I answer the phone, my my deal is I'll talk with you on and happily. I enjoy that. Sometimes you can't get me though. So I'm sorry if you find it difficult to reach me, but just I expect that if you've already reached me and we've already had business together, you should be able to reach me. Um, we do have the call scheduling still. I'm changing that around a little bit because I want to move people more towards the video membership, but I still want to be available. So we'll work through that. So I just want to mention that. Uh, and then I wanted to uh, go into... Before I get talk about FinCEN, we're going to talk about FinCEN, and I want to put this into perspective. I think it makes it easier to understand. FinCEN is about KYC, so if I forget to mention that, remind me. What I talk about, and I think my area of expertise is, is really about property rights. So property rights are being adversely impacted uh, through the money system. Okay, your use of money is so important, and that's what we're facing right now. KYC is not a problem. Just to understand what it is. So before I get into the FinCEN and before I get into property rights, because I'm going to talk about LLCs, I'm using that as a tool to manage property rights. I'm showing you guys how to do certain things, to apply it in, in ways that solve problems, financial problems, and prevent them. Um, way back, I should say, in the late 90s, Okay, I've been doing this work since 93, 94, and uh, around 2000, there's a couple things I did. Now, one of the things that, that was going on in the banking system, uh, and as, as you heard in the intro that Jim was nice enough to play, I deal with uh, consumer debt. And I came up with several methods and strategies. And in the beginning days in the 90s, I was able to file a couple of things in court and just make the attorneys go away because they were not funded to fight a case. Most people just gave up. And when I started, you know, filing actual documents that were written properly, they weren't expecting that and they would quit. And so that worked for a couple of years. And so we get into the 2000s and the attorneys started gearing up and they, they started, you know, organizing themselves and actually fighting the cases like they're supposed to. And so what I discovered is that the court system is just going to always pretty much in an unsecured debt, give a judgment to the bank. Now I can beat them in the beginning, but in the end, they're going to keep coming back to the courts. They just keep shopping for more judges. It's a waste of your time. So I thought, how can I make it to where it doesn't matter what they do in court? So I came up with this, a method. Now here's how it works. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because when I talk about FinCEN, you might think I'm crazy already. And maybe I've been lucky. I don't know, but you're going to, understand better how I think and maybe comprehend 
appreciate hopefully what my ideas are in FinCEN. Um, so I realized that there's a, there's a law called the Consumer Credit Protection Act that works like this. If a creditor sues you and gets a judgment lien and garnishes your wages, it blocks everybody else. That's if you do nothing, right? If you try to get an exemption and reduce the amount they're taking, it opens the door for the next creditor to come in. It's it's really, it's against, it's counterintuitive, right? It's against what your attorneys say. Your attorneys tell you to, to actually create a worse situation. Uh, and so what, what I discovered is that, that I could actually create a judgment lien first before the creditor. So if I if I get a client that's got 80,000 credit card debt and six, six unsecured credit cards, and I just go in before he gets sued or even in the middle of it. But if I, if I can beat the first wage garnishment or I can interrupt one that's already going on, which sometimes I have to do, what we would do is get a writ of garnishment from the court and we would create what I call a friendly judgment lien. So it's like a friendly lien, right? Like a equity stripping on your property, except this time we're using the court to create the lien. And in doing so, we're able to get a writ of garnishment and we don't garnish the client's wages. We just sit on it. And in almost every situation, some some states are a little bit different, but it blocks everybody else. And the attorneys don't understand what's happened. They just go, okay, well, whatever, we can't garnish. And so now my client can't doesn't have garnishment and I make him judgment proof and he's completely judgment proof. Even if he has W-2 wages, there's four states that don't permit wage garnishment. So, you know, I'd have to do this with uh, clients that are out of those states, Pennsylvania, Texas, and North Carolina and South Carolina do not allow wage garnishment. So here's the story. In order to do this, I came up with this method. Now I had to hire a programmer and I paid him a nice salary for about a year, year and a half. And he developed this. And when I told him the idea, he thought I was nuts. Of course, he was kind of, you know, an open-minded guy, luckily. So he built this platform. And what we did was as we took our customer in and we had high volume of customers. And so we were able to, uh, we, we have our customer database and then we would create a second database and the software did this for us. The software paired up groups of customers in threes. Now this is going to sound crazy, but it worked beautifully. We took two of the customers in the database and the customer understood this. Two of the customers were in the paperwork as the plaintiff for the friendly judgment lien. And the third client was the debtor that we're trying to protect. Okay. So we would, we would use this group to file papers. And of course we prepared all the paperwork. I had a team of people. We put this work together. We got the judgment liens usually within 90 days, sometimes a month. And we got our writ of garnishment and there's always some sort of difficulty, but we always work through it. And then in that group of three, the next two, like rotating around, the next two would sue that third one, right? And then we would do it a third time. The next two would sue the third one. So everybody had a friendly judgment lien and it was assignable and manageable and you can get out from under anytime you want. We had all the paperwork. It worked perfectly and it just blocked everybody. Now, sometimes we did it. There's, there's different variations on that. But anyways, I'm just explaining my thinking on this and I didn't know that it would work. I just knew what the rules said and how everything, you know, was operating and it was perfect. It worked so well. Um, the programmer was, you know, so elated that his, his coding was excellent. You know, he did such a great job. I just lucked out in getting the right people. So that was one example of a crazy idea that some people even said to me, that's illegal. You know, it's not illegal to do that because it comes down to you simply just borrowed money. And there was a priority lien before everybody else. So what? It looks just like everything else and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just like putting a lien on your house with your brother, Bob, right? Or setting up a company to be the mortgage lien holder as a second position, right? To strip the equity. There's nothing illegal about that. It's actually good estate planning in some cases. So that was one example. So the next one that came along was in like 2004 or something like this. These happened all about the same time. Now, this next one, I was attacked personally by the banks. And they, the way they attacked me, because they couldn't sue me, they tracked back that it was me that came up with this strategy, this next one I'm going to share with you. And they sued my neighbor in my neighborhood where I lived. They sued my neighbor and called me in for a deposition against my neighbor to simply investigate me and intimidate me. And it was kind of, you know, a little intimidating. Uh, but it, it was actually, when it was all said and done, uh, I just got bragging rights over it and it was kind of fun. And I had a good time. It cost me five grand because I hired the best criminal defense attorney there was in the town and he, we had fun with it. 
But uh, that's the consequence of what I did in that situation. And of course, that was legal. Now, here's what I did. The banks were inserting arbitration clauses in all the credit card agreements, which allowed them to bypass the court system and just get a rubber stamp on everything so fast, so cheap. I didn't get a chance to argue with them. And back then I was arguing with them. I was filing papers in court. I was going through the whole procedure. I was I was going through discovery and pretrial and all this stuff. And I thought that's the way I wanted to go until I had come up with, you know, this other method of the friendly judgment lien. So by putting the arbitration agreements, I thought, okay, I'm going to go do the research and find out about arbitration because it was new to me back then. And I'll just go and argue the merits of that. Well, it turns out that I couldn't. It's pretty good. It's pretty slick on them. But what they, what the mistake that the bankers made is that they were being solicited and it was being promoted, okay, to add binding arbitration to the credit card agreements by some law firm. It was like uh, Erskine and Fleischer or something like that. I, I forget who it was. But anyways... Who cares? Uh, so they were uh, pushing this and they were having seminars and they were teaching the banks that they can do this thing. And that, the, of course, the law firm would be the one representing them. Right. So they were it's just like double dipping or something. Conflict of interest, all kinds of just nonsense. What are you going to do? You're going to sue them. I thought, no, we're not going to sue them. Here's what here's what we'll do. Let's copy them. It's kind of like if you don't know how to play chess. Right. And someone's teaching you for the first time and you want to give them a run for the money. You just copy all the moves, right? It gets really annoying to the other player who knows how to play. And then he throws them off guard a little bit. Well, that's what we did. So not only did we copy the lawyers and the banks in arb adding arbitration clauses to all the credit card agreements for our new clients, we used the same set of rules that they had published and that they were using from the American Arbitration Association. We created a business plan. Now, this is way back. So I wrote up kind of a skeletal business plan and I shared it with some people in my network. And then they shared it with other people. Now, I, I couldn't have any part in that because I wanted there to be a separation just in case there was some, you know, they would say I, I was colluding or something like that. So anyways, we we published this plan and within maybe six months, nine organizations were formed and they were doing the same thing then that the banks were doing against our clients. So now we have nine arbitration firms that are serving our clients that are getting arbitration awards, winning because they're providing an arbitration service, just like the banks were, it's all corrupt. We were doing the same thing. We were getting awards and we were going to the court and getting them confirmed. And I remember the last time that happened, this is when the whole thing came to an end, which took about a year. So let's say about 18 months total. Maybe this came to a head around 2005 or six, something like that. And um, there was a, a judge in California that took all the arbitration petitions. An arbitration petition is when you get an award against somebody, you just go to the court and, the, and ask for it to be confirmed. That's all the judge does. He can't examine it unless there's an issue of fraud. So um, one of our arbitration firms had like a thousand of them. I mean, we were just, we were ripping the banks apart with this stuff. They didn't know what to do because it was their same scam. So the, the judge finally said, you know what? I can't do this. And I'm going to recuse myself. And that's where it stood. It was, that was the end. And I didn't know what to do. I just, I just waited. And sure enough, it came out in the news. You could probably find it on the internet that uh, the bankers finally uh, stopped doing that. Now, I don't know if they try to insert that recently in recent times, but back then it was quite effective. And you would say, well, that's illegal. And my response to that was, well, they're doing it, <laughs> you know, and that's the premise I went on and it worked. It, it actually stopped the law firm from promoting this to, it was back then it was MBNA. MBNA doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and then it was uh, Citibank. Those were the two big ones. So anyways, fast forward till now. Now, let me just, let me just tell you one more thing. So when you had all this foreclosure crisis come in, okay. So I looked at all the foreclosure documents and you heard in the news about unfair lending practices and you heard about the lost note and that sort of jazz. And of course that's, that's true. But you can use that in court, and it was it was useful. But that's arguing the merits of a foreclosure. I mean, if you, the problem is on a foreclosure, they have to foreclose. <laughs> There's no way around it. And yeah, they don't have the note, and it's all fraud, and it's forgery, and it's laundering money, and all these things. So what I would do is I would attack the law firms for identity theft, and I would sue the law firms and each individual attorney for the thousand dollar penalty under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, and I would do it in federal court. And sometimes I would do it in state court. You can do it in small claims too. And so by attacking the law firms, it jammed up the entire foreclosure process. And I was able to promise my clients to be able to stay in their homes 
save their money, not pay the property taxes, the insurance, or the mortgage payments, and then save that up. And then I would show them how to buy a house even with bad credit. So just they need a little breathing room, a couple of years. Some people, you know, some people milked it a little bit too far. They went four years, six years, but most people it was two years good enough for them. So of course, you know, that sounds crazy. So instead of just, you know, relying on challenging the note existence and all that sort of thing and the merits of the case, I brought in this other element. Uh, so anyways, that's a, just a, a quick review of what I did there. So over the years, I come up with creative things. And so all this has to do with property rights. When we get into cryptos and m using money and interacting with the banking system, they want your property rights, as you know. They want to intimidate you. This is a war, okay? They've already got everything else. They got control of the land, uh, the communications, the money supply, and they want to use the money supply to get your property rights. So we get into FinCEN. Now, FinCEN is a, a new a new agency, I believe, and it's I believe it's it's executed through the Internal Revenue Service. So it's kind of like a species of the IRS. FinCEN likes to operate on people's failure or lack of knowledge or their uh, erroneous disclosure of certain financial information when they're banking. That's why I, I discourage people from going offshore because you just bring FinCEN into the into the relationship there. If you go offshore, you're not actually helping yourself. It's making it worse. So then they have all these regulations. Now, FinCEN regulations relating to LLCs is more KYC. The data being disclosed or they want from you is the same data your bank's already getting. It's the same data the IRS already has. You, if you watch my video from the last um, discussion on this, I was explaining that they, the FinCEN agency calls this data, this tax return, taxpayer information, they call it uh, beneficial owner information. Okay, fine. It happens to be taxpayer information and it happens to be protected under the tax code and all these things, like I said in the video. So, and I mentioned, uh, I think it was last week or yeah, I think last week that I, I, I want to offer this service, okay? Because I, I'm i not going to try to convince everybody to not be afraid. If you want to be afraid of it, fine. I just think you should make a decision. If your property rights concerning money are important to you and you're sick and tired of this crap, I think I'm going to provide you with a means to fight. And I think you should. All right? I've been doing it for decades. I've been doing it, literally. Uh, every time there's something you know, some new rule or something, everybody runs and says, John, what do you think about this? You know, and we could, we can talk about that. Um, so what I'm going to say is on FinCEN regs, and certainly I can do questions today on that. On FinCEN regs, what I'm going to do is this. For a contract, and I charge a fee for this, when I do a limited liability company for you, or if you already have one, and you come to me for this service, what I will do is I will sign on to your company. I've never done this before as the corporate compliance officer and the organizer, if I'm the one organizing it. If I didn't organize it and you come to me afterwards, I can be the corporate compliance officer. I have a contract for this. Okay, now I'm gonna charge 1250 to do this per year. If you, want, if you want to not have the liability that you think you have, I'm gonna tell you right now, you don't need me to do this. I've said it before, but you, you still, not you maybe individually, but many, many people are still afraid of this. So the service is I take on FinCEN, me. My name shows on the contract. If FinCEN contacts anybody, it's going to contact me. Now, in some cases, they may contact the company through its registered agent. However, I set that up, we'll figure that out. But any communication from FinCEN goes to me. Then I deal with FinCEN because I have the authority exclusively as let's call it general counsel. That's kind of how it works. Okay. Now, what I suspect may be happening is the choke point of this whole thing is the banking system may say, because, you know, I'm telling you right now, there is no duty to report. I said this before, and this, this is a telltale sign when the bank says to you, you need a FinCEN number or we won't open your account. Your LLC needs one or we won't open your account. That tells you right there, it's not required. That's how they do it, okay? It's the same with the tax number. Your company is not required to have a tax number. Heck, you're not even required. If your company is filing a tax return, it's not even required to disclose its tax number on the tax return or a 1099. Your accountant will freak out if he hears me say that, but that's the truth, okay? I can show you the laws on that and the disclosure obligations and there's no penalty.
Okay. The IRS looks at that as a, what's called a de minimis failure, but that's a d different subject. But what I'm saying is when it comes to the FinCEN rigs, you don't need me to do this, but if you really want me to, I will do it. I will be your corporate counsel, but in the language of the FinCEN rules, it's going to be uh, the compliance officer for your LLC. I have no other interest in your company. I don't want an interest. Uh, you can fire me anytime you want. Okay. Um, I cannot quit though. <laughs> So when I'm your compliance officer under the contract, it's good for the year. And so there's like three roles there. So one would be the the uh, corporate organizer and one would be the uh, compliance officer. The contract covers both. If you come to me after you've already formed the company, somebody else is the organizer, no problem. I'll be the corporate compliance officer. I'm the sole person. I'm liable. That means your company is not, okay? Unless someone else is willing to take on that role, your company is liable for whatever FinCEN wants to do, all right? And you may be individually, okay? I will take that on. And that tells you maybe I'm stupid or I know the threat is not there. So I'm betting on that. The other aspect of this is if I do have to get a FinCEN number just to get your account opened for, the, for your company, the FinCEN number is not for your company. It's for the reporting company, which will be my company. And if you want to go look it up, I just registered one. I think it was yesterday or a couple of days ago, I registered one in Florida. It should be good there called John J. Singleton LLC. Remember I tell you guys, don't use your name and the company name. Well, I'm putting my head on the chopping block and that's what it looks like. All right. So I individually will be the compliance officer and the reporting company. If I need to do that will be my LLC, which is me sole member. Okay, call me stupid or we'll see what happens. I want to take these idiots on. I, I got so many things I'll sh I don't even want to tell you because it's just going to take us down a path. Who cares? Okay, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't see the liability, but I'm willing to take it on. So enough of that. Now, let me get into, so I know you want to ask a question. I'll, I'll get to you. Um, let me just say, so let me just do a summary here. But, um, property rights. Okay, so... We can, we can recognize when we have property rights, when it comes to, let's say money, really important stuff, money, and maybe it's in the form of precious metals, or maybe it's in the form of a receivable, or let's call it an asset, an investment, stock. Uh, maybe your money's in the form of you know a, a crypto, cryptographic currency. Maybe it's in the form of the sale of real estate or real estate receivables, things of that nature, okay? So property rights, if they're not, if they're not held correctly, uh, can be at risk to third party interference. <laughs> this is my encrypted way, my ambiguous way of saying that, uh, you know, the IRS can take your stuff, right? So I use a limited liability company as a vehicle to establish property rights in a way that prevents unwanted parties from getting a share of it without your consent, right? It keeps it away from them. By creating an innocent party or an ownership in a group, like two people that own an LLC, for example, okay? That's a perfect example uh, where their individual liabilities don't match up. They're not the same. So anything, the, the only time there would be a joint liability is when the two owners of the LLC have a joint liability, like they sign a, you know, a commercial lease agreement together or something like that, or they borrow money individually, or they do it through the company name and they accept to be the guarantor together. Okay, that's a liability that I can't avoid. But your old baggage, whatever's, you know, hovering around, credit card debt, whatever, even a bankruptcy, that does not come into something that's really important to you. The new venture, the new holdings, your new whatever speculation in cryptos, precious metals, whatever it is, that is now isolated. And part of that, part of that strategy is to remove the property from your estate. In fact, I think everything I do is removing property from your estate. Why the heck would I do that? Well, because you've acquired all kinds of craziness in your lifetime. You can't avoid it. Uh, and who knows what kind of liabilities you have attached to your name? I don't know. I don't care. All I know is you have rights and those rights can be exercised in a certain way that separates it from rights you have exercised previously. And I don't care what those are. Okay. This is the core of everything I'm doing. And that's why I get into categories. Like for example, um, we talk about the, uh, the lean on the collection use and storage of your biometric data. Okay. You have a property right with this. It's abandoned property. You haven't done anything with it. I showed you how to put a lien on it. I showed you how to create a royalty, a license agreement on it. Okay, that's essentially what you're doing. You're putting a mortgage 
on your data and you're making the collector of the data the debtor, the borrower, the licensee, okay? He owes you, all right? That is that is claiming a property right. That's how you do it. That's just my way of doing it, okay? Um, the other thing too, okay, so we got easements, HOAs. This is just another way of controlling title to real estate, always having the last word, always having a lien that does not get exhausted. And then on the easements, it's controlling possession of the property, irrespective of what happens to the title. Um, then I got into, and it sounds like a completely separate matter, right? But it's not because it has to do with property rights. When, I, when we're dealing with family court, interfering in your family, family court is a franchise or a subdivision. I like to call it a franchise because it's a business. Family court is nothing different than your state trial court. Like in Florida, it would be the circuit court. Okay. There's a family court division of the circuit court, but it's the circuit court. It's under the same rules minus a few. Okay. That's how it works in uh, Georgia. I think it's superior court, California superior court, you know, uh, uh, New York is called the Supreme court, even though it's the trial court. Okay. It's not the actual Supreme court, but it's the trial court. So anyways, in those matters, the court has limited jurisdiction. Now trial courts have the widest range of jurisdiction, but when it comes to uh, marriage, the courts are fairly limited. For example, let's call marriage a civil contract. It is recognized as a civil contract, okay? There's already terms in the marriage. So what's happening is you go into divorce court or you go into the court for child custody, right? You're getting the court to then use its police powers of contempt to force a party into something. That'd be like if you and I had a contract to do something, partnership, and we're working together, and uh, I wanted to change the contract. And maybe it's a good idea, but you don't want to change the contract. We have a written, that's why we have a written agreement, right? We have to follow through. Unless unless the other party agrees, can't change it. That's the way the law works. That's the way the contracts work. If I go to the court to, my partner doesn't want to change it, right? I go to the judge and I say, hey, judge, um, I'm petitioning the court for what? Oh, uh, modify the contract. I'm petitioning the court to, I don't know, Inter intervene in the contract. Oh, I want to petition the court to break the contract. <laughs> the judge is going to say, sorry, I can't help you. What difference is that from a marriage? It's a civil contract. And you go in there and the judge completely ignores the arrangement that you already had with taking care of the children, paying the bills, allocating money and all this stuff. And the, and the court says, you're going to do it this way now. Okay. The, the jurisdiction of the court is limited to in a, in a divorce proceeding is declaring the dissolution of the marriage. This is known as declaratory judgment. It also has powers for injunctive relief, but it cannot use those powers based on my research now. I know, I believe I'm correct, okay? Um, it's arguable. People can argue with it, but the court cannot use its position to impose new terms into the marriage. This is between the husband and wife and the parents, okay? Uh, nor can it alter existing, right? Make new terms that way. You can't go to the court to change a contract, right? This is what the premise is behind this. Again, it's a property right. Another example of a property right is what you and your spouse decided how you're going to take care of your children, who's going to pick them up after soccer practice and who's going to drive them there and how much money is going to be allocated for this. These are property rights, in the court is intruding upon them. It's destroying them. And there's a duty on the court, not to mention, we talk about jurisdiction all the time. Okay. That's a brief overview of jurisdiction. Okay. When it comes to this matter, but the court also has a different type of duty. Its duty is to preserve the status quo in almost every situation. So by just making an arbitrary rule that says, we're going to, we're going to split it and make it equitable. It's not equitable. <laughs> It's already equitable because of what we did, and it's still on us to decide what to do because we have property rights over how we manage our family. It's property rights. A decision is a property right, the right to make a decision, the right to make a choice. That's a property right, and it's being ignored and destroyed by the court system. Okay, so that's why I got into that. I didn't think I would ever get into that, but when I started seeing these cases and looking at it and then doing some research, I realized, wait a minute, this is all about property rights. And, and, it, and if you look in it further, you get, maybe you'll see, conclude the same thing I did. I think family court is being used to prevent the accumulation of wealth. I think it's creating financial hardship for many people. So that's just a brief overview of what, what I 
dude, this is my profession. Okay. I look at what property rights are, how people are being exploited uh, by the abuse of their property rights. And a lot of times people don't understand that they have property rights. So a lot of times I have to backtrack a situation they created unknowingly. You know, they try to do what they, what we, what we try to do is what we see on TV, unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, we're watching things on TV and we're thinking subconsciously, I guess that's how things are done. <laughs>